Hello and welcome to the Sharp 600, brought to you by Covers.com and presented by FanDuel Sportsbook. My name is Jason Logan, his name is Todd Furman, and this is NFL Week 7. And for the next 10 minutes, or some would say the Sharp 600 seconds, we're going to be blitzing the bookmakers here, giving all of our insights, giving all of our picks for what looks like a great slate of games here in Week 7. Todd, big splashy moves in the AFC East on Tuesday, of course. The tea leaves were right about the Jets. They bring in Devonta Adams. I guess what Rodgers wants, he gets. And then the Bills, not to be outdone, a few hours later, they land Amari Cooper and bolster their receiving core as well, too. Just want to get your thoughts on these wide receiver moves in the AFC East and what we're going to see from these teams going forward. I'm trying to figure out what the Jets are going to do at this point for an encore. Does this mean if they lose Sunday Night Football to the Steelers <laughs> that they sign Hassan Reddick to a four- or five-year deal? Because they have to do something in the wake of disappointing performances. For me, that really doesn't change my outlook on the Jets overall. I think there are some issues along the offensive line that were a mm-hmm. bigger concern than the receiving room. And defensively, while I know they check a lot of the boxes, they just haven't performed at that high level, especially against the run. Now, the Amari Cooper deal, I'm kind of with you here. I think this is a game changer for Buffalo in terms of what they're able to do now to create some of that balance. We saw how well they ran the football against the Jets, even without James Cook. We talked before the season started that Khalil Shakir wasn't a true number one. Well, now they have one, even if he is a grizzled veteran. I love the durability that we've seen from Cooper at number of stops along the way. But maybe most importantly, the real big winner in all this is Dalton Kincaid, who can stretch the middle of the field. So I think this Buffalo offense gets to be that much more dynamic, and their health is clearly trending up on the defensive side of the ball as well. Yeah, I agree with you as Cooper being the big plus out of those two trades. And and his ability to be that deep threat receiver is something that Buffalo didn't have this year. They kind of swapped out a lot of that downfield speed with Davis and Diggs. Those guys are gone. They brought in a lot of burly guys that are great in short yardage and those yards after the catch, and that's something that Buffalo has been good at so far. But now you add Cooper as that downfield threat with Allen's arm. Once they get going in the playbook, that's going to be a very, very dangerous pass defense. And then you mix in two great tight ends as well, too. And it's going to be, you got to pick your poison when it comes to the Buffalo Bills. Um, another kind of market trend in, across the industry here is we saw the hot start from NFL underdogs through the first four weeks. However, favorites have come roaring back, and the chalk over the last two weeks, 23-5 and five straight up, 27-1 and one against the spread. That includes a 10-3-1 and one ATS day from favorites in week six, and I know the book wake, bookmakers took one uh, on that one. I can't help but, uh, you know, not shit a tear for that one. <laughs> Tough one for the bad guys, but uh, I assume, you know, this is just kind of balance in the market coming back what do you see going forward here are we have we kind of reached the tipping point where underdogs are done favorites have had their thing everything's going to be kind of 50 50 the way out we know regression is always a thing in this business Mm -hmm. and for all the peacocking that the house was doing during the month of september with all the parlays the money line teasers and everything else that worked out in their favor chalk this one up for a win for the betting public you and i have been around this space for a long long time and i can't remember exactly the last time that we saw road favorites Compile not just a 9-0 straight up record, but go 9-0 and against the number. So every parlay, permutation, and everything else under the sun came home. And so I don't butcher it because I wanted some of my colleagues to look into the numbers and just how unique Sundays and Mondays along with Thursday's occurrence was. Mm-hmm. When we go through it, the nine covers by favorites in true road games was the most in a single week since 2000. The previous high was seven. It tied the most outright wins by favorites in true road games in a single week since 2000 uh, when we saw a team in week seven go nine and two. So definitely a watershed moment. The public clawed back some, but you have to imagine that bookmakers will exact their measure of revenge. But October is always interesting, Jason, because this is where you start to get the separation of the haves and have nots. Teams that trend up and make their ascent and other teams that just start trying to figure out what direction they're going to be going in for the remainder of the season. And speaking of directions, we kind of we took three steps forward and three steps back last week with the podcast picks. We went a ho hum three and three, which after the last two weeks, I think we'll take at that point just to kind of get us right. We had some good calls on spreads. We had good calls on totals. However, the touchdown anytime props for us, which were so hot to start the season, they have cooled off. Uh, and I always it always seems to be the guys that we pick that prior week, then find the end zone the next week. I feel like Murphy's law. Mark Andrews, congratulations. Josh Downs, congratulations. It's absolutely incredible. Yeah. Uh, And uh, who was it? uh, Who did I have for the Packers? He he scored. I think he scored twice on the weekend as well. Trust me. Trust me. I debated uh, loading up. uh, I debated loading up on Rashad Bateman this week because for all the scoring that the Ravens did, Bateman was the odd man out and all of that. Yeah. So I feel like we're ahead of the curve. Maybe we're just too 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 good at it that we're ahead of things. 
Um, yeah, that's that's exactly what it is. But uh, <laughs> before we get going here, reminder to uh, like and subscribe if you're watching us on YouTube, if that's how you take in the Sharp 600 each week. And if you're strictly an audio kind of guy, then uh, rate and review the podcast on whatever it is you do to listen to us. We appreciate that. It allows us to expand our reach, talk to a lot more sports bettors just like yourself. All right, Todd, we got a real nice looking schedule here in week seven. Let's go. 600 seconds on the clock. <laughs> All right, Todd, you got to indulge my inner twilight zone here because I'm going to talk about alternate dimensions and branch timelines and the multiverse, the what if of NFL betting, where every bounce of the ball creates a different reality. And we're going to get in the DeLorean here and we're going to travel six weeks into the future. We're going to go to week 12. It's, it's late November. It's one week before Thanksgiving. I'm going to give you two possible NFL realities and you tell me which one is the more likely outcome. So the first reality, we have the Kansas City Chiefs putting their undefeated record on the line against the Panthers, likely laying like two touchdowns in that game. Or we have Deshaun Watson suiting up for another start for the Browns starting QB, uh, taking on the Steelers Thursday Night Football. What is the more likely reality? I think it's that Deshaun Watson will still be under center for the Cleveland Browns. And the reason I say that he may give them the best opportunity to tank the season and try and put them in a position to draft the next franchise quarterback. That contract just feels like an albatross, and I think Deshaun will still be under center unless he gets injured between now and then. That's that's where my head was at. And they do have some tough defenses uh, ahead, of, so can he survive that sort of thing? And then Casey's got San Francisco this week, Tampa Bay in Week 9. you got to go to Buffalo in Week 11. That's a big spot for the Bills there as well, too. The next two realities, we have Tua Tagovailoa and the Dolphins. Knocking on the door of the AFC wild card, taking on the Pats in week 12. Or we have Doug Peterson sitting back, putting his feet up, enjoying a bye week, knowing that his job is secure when the Jaguars come back for week 13. What is the most likely reality? I mean, Peterson may still be employed, but job security will not be in his lexicon in any, by any stretch. I think Tua <laughs> potentially keeping the Dolphins relevant. We know their schedule gets to be more difficult, but if they're able to navigate through some of these troubled waters and get a win this week as a short road underdog against the Colts, maybe the outlook starts to improve there. So I think the Dolphins will have a shot to be in the AFC wildcard mix. Yeah, and, and Tua, we're hearing rumblings that he's going to be good to go very more sooner than later, I guess. I will say, though, the Jags have a nasty schedule, and if they don't get past Patriots, I think that's a, that's a death kneel right there, but you've got... Uh, he, he may need to pay to fly home from London, and I don't think he'll be doing it in first or business class if Doug Peterson has to do it on his own dime, should they get upset Sunday morning. And here's who they played after that game. you got Green Bay, Philadelphia, Minnesota, and Detroit. So, not I don't good. know. Not good, yeah. Bob. Not good at all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. The next two realities. We have the Chicago Bears host the Vikings in a battle for first place in the NFC North in Week 12. Or we have the Atlanta Falcons getting a well-earned break on the bye week after extending their winning streak to eight straight games. What's the most likely reality there in Week 12? Spoiler alert on the Falcons. More about that a little bit later in this program. Um, I think that the Bears are trending up, and I love what I've seen as far as development from Caleb Williams. Shane Waldron appears to be much more comfortable calling plays. Now, I know their strength of schedule has left a lot to be desired, but for that to happen, I think the Lions have to fall off the pace a bit, and losing a defender, the caliber of Aiden Hutchinson, could create a gaping hole for that stop unit. So asking the Bears to be in the discussion for the NFC North crown does not feel like that big a leap of faith if Caleb keeps maturation maturing the same way he has. All right, and a great two-way game there last week. All right, Todd, we played Fave or the Field a couple weeks ago when the award markets were a little iffy, but now we've got six weeks of results, and we're seeing some of the definitive favorites now under 2-1. to one. So the best of the number has long sailed, of course, but let's look at it. Is it worth saying maybe we buck the trend and we go against the consensus in some of these and take the field? So we're going to play a little game of uh, Fave in the Field for these award props. We're going to start with Offensive Player of the Year. We're going to talk Derrick Henry. He's plus 140, the touchdown machine. Or are you going to take the field to win Offensive Player of the Year? I'm going to take the field. This number just way too short for me with the battering ram. I know he continues to be the ageless wonder the amount of time and money he puts into his body to perform at this level, at this point in his professional career and the amount of tread on the tire. But I feel there are other offensive players, whether it's at the running back position or wide receiver room, as those guys start to get healthy, that are going to be able to cut into that lead a bit. The one thing about these awards, which will be a recurring theme, it's what Mm -hmm. have you done for me lately? And there's so much ground still left to cover. 
All right, maybe offensive rookie of the year is a done deal. We see Jalen, uh, Jaden Daniels, minus one ninety odds on favorite. Is it his to lose now, or are we even thinking about the field? You know, I think it is his to lose. I think Caleb Williams has closed that gap a little bit, but I don't think Malik Neighbors missing multiple games and Marvin Harrison potentially missing time as well. It's a two-horse race here, and unless Jaden really falls apart, I think this is a guy with a softer schedule than what the Bears will have to go through in the NFC North is the guy to watch. I actually like the favorite in this market, even at a price approaching $2. Okay, comeback player of the year is a weird one because they changed the rules around this, so it has to be kind of an injury-related thing. We got Kirk Cousins, plus 180, or the field. You know, I actually think Kirk offers some upside here, plus 180. All of us before the year were talking about Aaron Rodgers being that guy, but I can't Mm -hmm. see him necessarily getting back into the race, even with Devontae Adams. You mentioned the unique wording around it. Some books still have Sam Darnold, one of the short shots on the board, but he's not coming back from anything other than being Mm -hmm. a second-string quarterback. So I think Kirk Cousins is a worthy favorite and still offers a little bit of upside at plus 180. I can't buy in a DeMar Hamlin. All right, real quick here. Coach of the year, it's Kevin O'Connell, plus 145, doing a hell of a job in Minnesota. Is it him or is it the field? Oh, I'm taking the field here. I think there are plenty of other worthy candidates that are going to warrant consideration as we get deeper into the campaign. All it'll take is a couple of losses for the Vikings, that number to shorten. So I'll take the field over O'Connell. All right, let's talk Thursday night football. we got Broncos and Saints. Nola getting two and a half points, pretty banged up for this game. Todd, what do you like? Any bets, any insights for this uh, midweek game? You know, honestly, Jason was real close to making the Denver Broncos a best bet, but the money line price has gotten away from me a bit. I still think mm-hmm. at the south of three, it offers some upside. But the reality of it is, you mentioned, the Saints potentially down two wide receivers, everybody on the O line, they're starting quarterback. They're just not constructed as a top 30 team right now. Broncos are passed, and don't be surprised if Bub Means is the guy that can flash for the Saints with that depleted receiving room. Had one last week. I had to look up who the hell the guy was. Uh, Cortland Sutton, over 45 and a half receiving guards. That's where my money is. Bo Nix only has eyes for Cortland Sutton. And uh, Nick's getting a little more comfortable pushing the ball downfield as well, too. The Saints, Saints offense is going to be in rough shape, like you mentioned. All those injuries. I just think, don't think they're going to be able to hang on to the football. And Denver's Sean defense Payton is going to give... revenge game. Sean That's Payton right. revenge game. Circle That's right. the wagons. And the defense is going to give this offense plenty of, of touches. Uh, A lot of projections north of 50 yards for him. I said 54 yards. So I like Cortland Sutton to go over 45 and a half yards on Thursday night football for the Denver Broncos. Minus 115 to FanDuel. Time for touchdown and anytime props for week seven. Todd, why don't you get us started? I'm going to jolly old London with a player that found Pater last week, albeit in a very different stadium than where we'll be playing this week. That, of course, would be Gabe Davis, who dropped the early opportunity but capitalized later in the game. You look at Gabe Davis so far and what he's meant to this Jags offense when healthy. Nine red zone targets. Hasn't tied for fifth in the league in that department. Mm -hmm. I think this Patriots secondary a little bit overrated. Gabe Davis, make it happen twice as nice this week. I'll take him anytime touchdown, plus $2 or better. All right, I'm going with Raheem Mostert, plus 130 to find the end zone. Miami coming off the bye, that means we get a full-strength Mostert. This is a guy that struggled with injuries early on in the season, but now all healthy and ready to go. He had 19 carries in Week 5. Devon Achan, not clear of concussion protocols yet, so all those carries could go pretty much to Mostert. He's got a nose for the end zone. He gets the goal line carries and faces a Colts red zone defense. That is pure doo-doo, so I like Raheem Mostert, plus 130 to find the end zone here for the Miami Dolphins in Week 7. Two-minute drill time, and that means our best bets for NFL Week 7. Todd, honors are yours. I'm going to take the Seattle Seahawks at plus three, but do shop around. There are plenty of two-and-a-halves in the market. I know as we sit here and break this game down on Wednesday, anxiously awaiting the injury report for Seattle. I do think the extra time off at the mini-buy will have that defense trending up. This will be an all-in effort, riding a three-game losing streak, and I think the schedule congestion we saw was readily apparent in that Thursday night game against the 49ers. Traveling across the country, the perfect cure-all against this Falcons defense that can't generate pressure. Seahawks. All right, going with the L.A. Chargers. They're going to keep it clean. We're going to go money line. It's minus 142. This is actually one of my first bets of the week. I got the minus 130. The price has grown here, but... Arizona has a laundry list of elements all over the place, specifically on defense, and they could be missing three starters at all three levels. The Chargers coming off their best two-way performance. This is a team that to just grind it out. Herbert looking healthy, offensive line looking sharp, taking on an Arizona defense that is bad to begin with. So I like the Chargers' money line straight out. And I am going to go to one of the marquee matchups of the week in the Bay Area where the 49ers will try and exact a measure of revenge 
for what got away from them in the desert. I'll lay the short number here with the 49ers. Although they do shop around, if you can find the money line, that would probably be my preferred approach. Mini buy here. I know Andy Reid off a of buy, but this Kansas City team has been flirting with disaster. Just don't have the offensive weapons, in my opinion, if this game gets a little bit loose and free. The 49ers have had this game circled. They'll be able to execute and test this Chiefs secondary. Right, I took the Chiefs this week, so we are butting heads on that game. But... This is one that you and I can both appreciate. Buffalo Bills team total under 25 and a half points, minus 108. Now, the Bills, they come back on the short week. They got to play another top tier defense in Tennessee. And the Titans, currently number six in EPA allowed per play, number nine in DVOA. They're allowing the shortest yards per play at 4.3. They're good on third downs. They're good in the red zone. The Bills' offense relies on the short passes, relies on the yards after the catch. What are the Titans really good at? Sniffing out those yards after the catch <laughs> and tackling. Avoid the Will Levis pick six. Avoid the Will so, Levis pick six. So this, this is it. This is it. I do like the points with the Tennessee Titans. I took them in my underdogs column. However, we all know how that ends. So I'm going to take the scenic route on this handicap. I'm going to go Bills under 25 and a half points against the Titans in week seven. Make sense? All right. That is the horn. That is another 600 seconds in the can for NFL Week 7. A big thank you to Todd. A big thank you to Dell. A big thanks to FanDuel Sportsbook. And, of course, a big thank you to, to you for tuning in. A reminder, like and subscribe, rate and review. Do all those things that help us pump up the podcast. We appreciate that love. Todd, any final words here for Week 7? You know, what goes up must come down. And that gaudy underdog record started to see regression hit square in the face for Week 6. Uh, and I know we talked off air about how this is kind of where teams start to go in different directions. So odd makers will scramble with some of these numbers. We'll see mm -hmm. if the underdogs have a little bit more bite this week than what we saw last week. But I don't expect home underdogs to perform at the same clip we saw from road favorites last weekend. All right, good stuff. We will be back next Wednesday for week eight, which is insane. I can't believe we're there already. Until then, best of luck with your bets. Hey, NFL fans, you can make every moment more this season with a big return on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. So when you get a hunch in the middle of a game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, -play, and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. You'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. Never waste a hunch at FanDuel, an official sports book partner of the NFL. Must be 21 plus and present in select states or 18 plus and present in D.C., First online real money wager, only $5 first deposit required. Bonus issued as non-withdrawable bonus bets will expire seven days after receipt. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit fanduel.com slash RG. Call 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat in Connecticut or visit mdgamblinghelp.org in Maryland. Hope is here. Visit gamblinghelplinema.org or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support in Massachusetts. Or call 1-877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY in New York.